Rick Weston. I, as I said earlier, I run a nonprofit who's, uh, who advises governments on energy policy. And uh, Kennedy has asked me to talk a little bit about these three sections, sections 501, 502, and 503 of, uh, of, the, of the Act. And um, in doing my research, I came to the conclusion that uh, there's some really interesting language in those sections that in another world might really provide the basis for doing uh, some interesting work. Uh, and it's all here. You can, it's all on Wikipedia as well. Uh, and what you know is that the US shall endeavor to cooperate with other nations, international institutions, and shall seek to cooperate with uh, and uh, give aid to developing countries in meeting their energy needs uh, through the development of such resources and application of non-nuclear technologies, yada, yada, yada. Uh, that's in the policy side of it, very, very straightforward. Uh, programs, there's all, all kinds of things here, and, and Bob was talking about them. Uh, you wanna read that off here? I can barely read it, uh, just uh, this one line I wanna get to. Uh, <laughs> DOE, AID, Department of State, mm -hmm. shall initiate, uh, as soon as practicable, a program for the exchange of United States scientists, technologies, and energy, energy experts. Uh, tech technicians, rather, uh, with those in developing countries uh, to implement the purposes of this section. And finally, sometime in 1979 or early 1980, the president was to report to Congress on the feasibility of expanding the cooperative activities ex established here um, to include a scientific peace corps <coughs> for the purpose of engaging in projects and meeting energy needs of such countries through um, through research, I obviously can't spell, uh, for the utilization of indigenous energy resources and suitable technology, uh, renewables, and other non-conventional technologies. Uh, I love the idea that the words Peace Corps are in the legislation like that. Very, in 1980, GAO reported on this, uh, and they recommended that the, uh, the requirements of Section 5, you know, the 500 sections, uh, a comprehensive policy should be uh, formulated and promulgated. Uh, all the relevant agencies and institutions agree, uh, and it should also uh, involve, and this is part I like as well, obviously other multilateral institutions and uh, international donors. Uh, it went on to say that um, no new programs, however, have been initiated in response to the title. Okay, and that was in March of 1980. Well, there was another report in 1981, which said some interesting things. Uh, and once again, said no funds have been uh, appropriated for Title V programs, uh, and it has not been used for a justification for any ongoing or planned programs, even though, as it turns out, as GAO says here, um, the need for retaining the title is dubious because Existing programs are already doing this sort of stuff, and that's what the Reagan administration said. Uh, in 1980, the U.S. Th this is the number that I found. It was in the report. The U.S. gave 109 million in energy assistance, mostly through USAID, about 75 percent of it, uh, to developing nations, and none of it was funded under Title. So they didn't it didn't justify it as Title uh, Five mm -hmm. funding. And since then, so far as I can tell, there's been radio silence. Well, there's been one change. The 1995 Congress said, please don't send the report. Oh, okay. There you go. Uh, <laughs> even, even better. Don't remind us. <laughs> How close did the OTA closing was that day? Don't remind no, us. Was, <laughs> but, but just to compare, now uh, it, it, so 300 to 400 million is the current figure. Okay. I couldn't find the current figure. I looked yeah. for it, so I'm really glad yeah. you're able to. But t but it's two billion with all the other with all the seven. other. So, so you're counting OPEC and thing. I mean, because it's not in 300. Not no, no. not in the 300. No, no, two billion, billion to 400. Yes, right. in the bigger one. Right, right. Because I just think that you know, in this new world, talking about the deployment money that's actually profitable for the government is uh, is great. Is a piece that you know we don't normally talk yeah, about. That's right. That's, that's mm -hmm. that bigger story. That's so. that, that's right. Um, Dan said this, Bob made a <coughs> reference to this. Here's a map of, this is done by a gentleman uh, that I've done some work with and went to school with, a guy named Tom Filer, he's in Boulder. Uh, he had been with RMI for a while, he's doing some other stuff now. 40% um, of 
the energy use in 2040 will be uh, by the, taken by the lar globally, the largest cities in Asia. And pretty much all of those cities, except for Singapore and those in Japan, are in what we call developing countries. Okay? Um, I wanted to put this up just in case we hadn't had this conversation, but we have. Excel in Colorado just uh, received bids in response to an RFP for uh, new resources. Wind came in at eight, you know, 1.8 cents a kilowatt hour, uh, excuse me, solar, solar. Uh, and wind at three cents a kilowatt hour. That's total cost. These are operating costs of the competition, which is the existing units, uh, let's see, yep. nuclear, I can't read gas and coal. And I don't. Oh, just operating for the just operating. So multiply it by ten. Yeah. 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 But this is existing <laughs> stuff. Okay. So again, yeah, it's now it's, it's always important. It's always important to say, look. I mean, and, and Dan was getting at this earlier. It's always important to say, okay, we're not comparing entirely on price. Uh, we we compare on operating characteristics. Uh, it's always compared to what. What am I getting for this? And what do I need to make this happen so as to reform the entire system? But these are extremely powerful numbers, yeah. okay? And it's not, and we don't, it doesn't depend on storage to make it happen, although storage, as, it, as we know, the prices are coming down and that will be certainly. But the next version of the graph, I mean, we're, we're, you're gonna be seeing in a couple of years, Berlin just committed right. to having four days of storage, right? right. Yep. So the next right. graph is gonna be that 30, oh plus the storage premium, and it's still gonna be under. Actually, th these numbers include. Uh, but but four include hours, but, that's, right. but that one's with four hours of thermal of right. storage, right? right? So we're gonna soon see graphs that are renewables with, you tell me how many days, you want two, three, four days. Right. Some will be higher, some will be less, but they now be. the old arguments are really gone, right? When you're right. doing base load renewable. Yeah. Right. Okay. And, yeah. and over 50% of the power additions uh, in the last two years have been renewable. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very quickly, just to give you an idea of some of the international clean energy activities today. You, now, you, this is the world I inhabit, uh, Dan, as well. Uh, just roughly, philanthropy, Western philanthropy, and it's primarily West Coast philanthropy as well, the U.S. <laughs> philanthropy, and uh, uh, in Europe as well, somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 million a year. Uh, it's Packard Foundation, Hewlett Foundation, folks mm -hmm. like that. Uh, Regranters, the Energy Foundation, European Climate Foundation, they're all dedicated. The Children's Investment Fund Foundation, a new actor in this space out of London. Uh, Bloomberg, of course, there's all kinds of money going into technical assistance, policy assistance across a whole range of activities uh, that's ultimately aimed at CO2, but all the other pathologies, if I can use that word, that go with it. We've already talked about the US, uh, I wanted to name, mention as well the National Laboratories. Lawrence Berkeley does a lot of work in this space. Uh, we've just, in fact, completed a project with LBNL that was funded by the State Department. So it's, it's all in the, in the family. Europe, the European Commission is doing a lot of work in Asia now, particularly China. Uh, Germany's GIZ, which is the equivalent of AID. Uh, Denmark has been doing wonderful work in China. It's pulled back a little bit and has been getting replaced. It's, funding by SIF, uh, and the UK Prosperity Fund, which is its aid. Uh, where we work with the uh, UK Embassy in China to help uh, identify projects as well. So there's some really good things happening uh, here. Our, my organization's role in all this, or, or you know, our view of the world, as I said earlier, is about fundamental underlying policy to make the investment uh, and market structures uh, work in such a way that you reward the outcomes you want instead of the, uh, the ones you don't. Can but you just, I mean, you don't have to have the number, but the, the scary thing that I've heard from several people is if you add up the actual money spent in 2017, Myanmar might beat China, which I found unbelievable two it's years back. But in, spent in, in, I'm sorry. In, in, the direct aid, oh. in, the, in, in the direct aid spending for last year. Oh, okay. Uh, that may be. I don't. I, I would have never. I mean, I just want to. Yeah, I would have never thought you could beat the numbers for. I mean, so numbers for China. whether it's right or wrong, I don't know. Right. But it, it, it says something. Kind of watch this space. Right. Yeah. Okay. And there's a. So, so sorry, that's eight from Berlin. 
No, no, aid to uh, to me and yeah, from, for, for, from for everyone else. Who and, wants and this is a good point. It's a good point because I'm going to get to something that just came up. I just came in from London where we had discussions about Southeast Asia mm -hmm. uh, and increased work. But the focus, as I said, is CO2 reductions. And the theory is, of course, decarbonizing electricity, uh, then electrifying transport buildings and industry. Mm -hmm. uh, we can do it with the technologies we have. It's about uh, policies, wholesale market reforms, regulatory reforms, renewable portfolio standards, and other obligations of those sorts. And something we haven't really been talking about, although it's come up at points today, and that is end-use energy efficiency. Not merely load management on the demand side, mm -hmm. but embedded efficiency. It remains the cheapest resource, OK? Mm -hmm. uh, and China has a, a, a vast uh, program for uh, investing in energy efficiency that is not connected directly to the power sector. So they don't think of energy efficiency as a resource the way you would think of it, the way we try to think of it here as an alternative that you that you test through the models that, that Dan has been talking about. But I mean, about. so China and others are investing truly in megawatt power plants. Huge. Now, so you really huge can't amounts. get buildings that are aggregating efficiency and selling it. Yep, mm -hmm. huge amounts. So where are the um, venues, the major producers? We, you know, philanthropy is looking at the major producers of CO2, and as we just said, it's going to be Asia in the next 30 years, but China, uh, Europe, India, Latin America, and now Southeast Asia and Oceania are areas where philanthropy are, uh, where philanthropy is, is looking. Um, so just to finish up then, concluding thoughts. So I'm sorry this is, I got screwed up here somehow. Um, that, what you can't see there is that, in my view, the logic of, the underlying logic of Title V is sound. I, I, I love the idea of an Energy Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. And here we have a network that already exists. And it's really about scaling it up. It's been created over the years by USAID and philanthropy. I started doing, I was going to India in the 90s on USAID money. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, it's way before that. And, I, and this thing, scientists, technicians, and energy experts, we have a, a field of them that uh, could be deployed further. In, you know, so we're talking about incremental work. Mm -hmm. uh, and can be scaled up, in my view, with relative ease. Of course, that's, you know, that's, I mean, I guess, optimistic. So is Title, here's the question, is Title V useful at all as, as leverage for additional funding? Um, you know, I doubt it. 